Hey everybody, welcome to part three of our switching regulator tutorial in Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson. And today, what we are going to do with our switching regulator is we are going to finalize everything and get it ready for production. What I'm gonna do is run through the layout as it sits now, and I'm going to show you some of the things you might wanna look for when you go to clean up a project and get it ready for manufacturing. We're also gonna go through some of the drawing tools and make sure that we have everything that we need in our documentation so that this board can get fabricated and assembled properly. That's what we're gonna look at. Let's get started. Okay, so let's jump back into our switching regulator layout. So this is how the layout came out. Just from looking at this in 2D or looking at it in single layer mode, it might not always be obvious that there is anything that you need to clean up. So sometimes what you need to do is look at the layers in, in a group or you need to run a design rule check or you need to put this bad boy into 3D in order to see any of the problems. As I put this thing into 3D, we can already see a couple of problems here in the lower left corner. And if you look at these holes and know that this is a power regulator, there's a couple other problems that you can identify here too. So first things first, we have some silk screen problems. You can see right here, C5 is falling onto a via that is untented. So basically what's going to happen during uh, fabrication is uh, they're going to try and apply silk screen to a piece of copper here. And we don't wanna have any of that silk screen fall into a piece of copper. Same thing right here with this component outline. So there's a couple of things we need to adjust there. And then you can even see right here with this component outline, we would need to adjust this as well, or we would need to move this via. Looking at these input and output holes, what do we see? Well, we know that this is a power regulator, so there's going to be a positive input and a ground input. And so of course, we would wanna make sure that we label those and those are unlabeled right now. So we're gonna to have to add labels there. And then whatever else comes up in the design rule check, we'll wanna make sure that we address that as well. So just to get started, I'm gonna to go to tools, design rule check, run the design rule check and see what comes up and we'll see what uh, kind of cleanup we need to do. So you can see here that we have a few different things that are actually pretty common when you try and make a layout pretty dense. All of these things are gonna be really common. We tried to make this layout as dense as possible just to try and combat noise and get to a really small regulator. And these are the exact type of errors that you would expect to see. So here, a solder mask slivers, again, that's really common. How do you deal with this? You may just need to uh, adjust the rule here and pay attention to what these values are, or you may actually need to adjust the solder mask expansion value. Silk to solder mask clearance. So what is the minimum uh, clearance constraint between a silk screen and any borders on your solder mask. Here you can see that there are four of those. And then of course, silk to silk clearance. So silk to silk is just the potential for overlapping silk screen. So the overlapping silk screen can occur because of any kind of misregistration. And then there's also these other silk to pad issues that we identified just from looking in 3D. So those are the things that we wanna clean up um, of course, we've identified all of them in design rule checks, but some of this stuff you could actually identify visually if you're savvy enough. So first things first, with these designators, simplest way to deal with this is just move this thing down. There are no other components around here that are going to be ambiguously labeled. So we can already see right here that just moving this down is gonna clear that up. We got another issue here with the designator L1. Um, you can see it's got less than 10 mil clearance. Just moving it up by one tick on the grid clears that up. Here we've also got a clearance error, and I'll deal with this one in just a moment uh, for a specific reason, and we'll get into that. This capacitor C5, you notice here in 3D, this component outline is falling right onto this pad. So how do we deal with that? Well, we could modify the footprint, or we could just move this capacitor down a little bit. So I'm just gonna do the easy thing and just grab this component, and we'll just move it down a little bit. So here it is on the top layer. I'm gonna use the selection filter to just grab this guy and just move it down just a little bit. Now, when you make this movement down, you can check in 3D that the component outline right here no longer falls onto this pad, so we're good. But then we're just gonna to need to adjust one of these traces, and then we're gonna to have to adjust the polygon here on the switching node. This adjustment is real quick. I mean, I literally just drag this over here and it's gonna be good. And then here for the polygon, just grab uh, the switching regulator, output polygon, resize it just a little bit. 
After we do that, we can just do T, G, A, and that's gonna re-pour all the polygons. And there we go. So we've gone ahead and fixed all of that. Next, what do we have to deal with? Uh, so then we have this via here. We need to move this via just a little bit out of the way. So to do that, again, hit your selection filter, go through and grab this, and you can move this out just a little bit. Also, it would be a good idea to then grab this small section of polygon here. You would wanna do a re-pour. So after we re-pour it, you see it adds just a little bit of clearance between the switching node to then get you exactly to where you need to be. And you could even move this down just a little bit like this, re-pour it, and that's gonna give you some more room here. So this is looking good so far. And as you go through each of these checks, you wanna make sure to eventually just rerun the verification report and go back through and clear up all those errors. Okay, so I mentioned also the polarity indicator. So this is a power regulator. We wanna make sure that we very clearly indicate the polarity. So how are we gonna indicate the polarity? There are a few ways to do it. You could just write out plus 12 volts. You can see right here, this is the plus 12 volt net. So we could put plus 12V in the silk screen layer right here. We could then put ground right here. And then we could do the same thing over here. So we'd wanna put like what our output voltage is in ground. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now and then we'll take a look at what it looks like. Okay, so I've gone ahead and added in our polarity indicators. I went ahead and changed the font so that it gets to a little bit smaller font size. And then when we look in 3D, you can see where they're gonna appear. One thing that can sometimes happen with components like this and with the silk screen when you have these very tight clearances is of course adding in new silk screen could then put you right at the border of having that silk screen overlap onto a pad. So just always make sure that you check that, make any minor little adjustments that you might need to make and move that out of the way, make sure it all lines up and looks good, and then you're gonna be good to go. So one other thing that we're gonna to need to do is, of course, this being a power regulator, it might need to mount onto something, and so we should place some mounting holes. So some mounting holes are gonna be simple to place. You can literally just grab a via or a pad. Um, here, I'm just gonna grab a via, and we're gonna to wanna to place them in the corners somewhere, and we need to size them properly. Here, I'm working in mils, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna set a hole size of 125 mils. So that's about an eighth of an inch, so that's pretty big and you can actually see how large that is just looking here in this uh, layout with respect to this stitching via over here up in this corner. So here, once we apply this, we don't have to set it to ground. You could actually set it to like no net if you want, but I am always a fan of grounding out those mounting holes if they're gonna be plated. So I'm just gonna leave it grounded. Then once we get this set, uh, we can modify the pad size. Pad size, we'll go ahead and set to 150 mils. Once we set it here, you're going to notice that there is a design rule error here. Now you have to be careful with using vias as mounting holds because if your design rules are set up as such that you have an upper limit on your via size, which is generally the case, it's gonna flag another design rule error. So you don't have to use vias, you could actually do it as a pad as well. So I'm just gonna show you how that would work. So if we do it as a pad, I can just go ahead and kind of place it here, delete that extra one. So then once I place this as a pad, I can then go ahead and put in the same kind of shape that we had before. So here we had 150, here we also had 150, here we had a hole size of 125, and this could be your mounting hole. Once you place this, you can then just copy it to the other four corners if you want. So like I said, this is pretty big in relation to the board. So would your board wanna use this size? Probably not. It's just gonna depend on what size mounts you're gonna have available. So we're actually gonna reduce this a little bit. We're gonna make it 75 mils. We'll reduce the pad size down to 100 mils. And we'll go ahead and put this up here in the corner like this. And then we can copy this onto the other four corners. So now you'll notice when I get up to this other fourth corner that we've got a little bit of a conflict here because this mounting hole is now going to land right on this pad where we have to mount this capacitor. So we're actually gonna to need to move that capacitor if we wanna have a mounting hole right there in that spot. As I'm doing this cleanup, I'm gonna to wanna to watch for things like that. And this is one of the reasons that it's actually good to do the mounting hole application first. 
So any of those kind of mechanical constraints that you're going to have, like the location of a mounting hole, in this case, maybe the location of these two holes where we're going to have our uh, power input with flying leads, um, we would want to place those first and lock those in place. So we didn't do it in this project just because we're doing it as a demo, but in a production project, you would definitely want to place those first. Just to kind of continue the cleanup, what I would want to do then is uh, grab these two caps and this little section of track, just move them over just a little bit, and then we can do some adjustment here. We'll just have to adjust this polygon over. It's getting a little close to the switching regulator, but that's okay. Once we hit report all polygons, you can see now we've cleared all of that up. You'll wanna go through this process and just check the design rules each time and make sure that you get this all cleaned up. We have another design rule here that we'll have to deal with as well. So um, I'm gonna leave it up to anyone who's following along to continue looking at this type of layout and do the cleanup that they need to do in their version. So as we go back into 3D, we can already see what's causing that other design rule error up here on this pad. And this is another reason to continue checking things in 3D, right? We have C1 here. This designator is falling right into this mounting hole. So again, I just want to go back into the top overlay. I want to grab this guy and move it over. And so we've got limited spacing here, but one thing that you can do in this type of situation is you can line up the designators like this. So it's very clear that in this row of two components, this guy is going to be C1, this one's going to be C2. So that's pretty simple. And just make sure you've got enough spacing here so that it's very clear which uh, components are which, but you don't have any kind of clearance issues. The last thing I wanna bring up now is tenting on these vias. So you'll notice here that if you look at some of these stitching vias, right here like this one, that this via is tented. And you actually don't have to be in 3D in order to see this. If you're in 2D and you just go to one of the layers, you just select one of these vias. If you look in the property panel and you scroll down near the bottom with the solder mask expansion rule, you will see right here there's a checkbox that says tented and you can tent on just the top or just the bottom layer. Tenting vias means that they are covered in solder mask. And if we had just decided to say tent all of these vias from the get-go, we wouldn't have had to move C5. Because if you remember C5, this reference designator was falling right onto this via. And so we could have just tented the via and then we wouldn't have had to worry about it. Then we're able to print silk screen onto that portion of the solder mask and we won't have to worry about it. So that's one option for dealing with this. And it's actually quite common to tent all the vias in a PCB layout. Do you have to? Not necessarily, there are reasons for doing it. What I'll actually do is I will link to an article in the description that talks about via tenting because it is important when you're talking about PCB uh, layout cleanup. So just keep that in mind. So I think we've hit everything here. We're gonna do one more run on the design rule check and see what comes out. Okay, so we've only got three of these errors left. These errors are the solder mask sliver. So solder mask sliver, how big does it need to be? Well, we actually have another video where we talked about this. And so we're gonna link to that video in the description. I encourage you to go watch the solder mask sliver video. But what you're seeing here in this set of results is that all of these are actually less than 10 mils, but they're bigger than five mils. And so generally the rule that I try and put in place on PCB layouts is to have at least five mil solder mask sliver. So I think these are gonna be just fine. You would wanna check this with a fabricator. They should list it in their capability statements, but this is the kind of thing where you can just go into the design rules and then you can just change the design rule so that here in this mask, you can actually set the uh, the sliver size. So give me just a moment and I'll go ahead and change that. So here under the, uh, the manufacturing section, you can see here is our sliver rule and we can just set this down to five mils. In most cases, this is gonna be fine. Again, just check with your fabricator. So that's it. This thing is all cleaned up. And um, the last thing that we might wanna place on here is fiducials. This is another thing, check with your manufacturer to see if you need it. Um, but you're gonna see here that there's enough elements here that they should be able to tell the orientation of this board. The next thing I wanna do is just go back here into my fab drawings do another import and make sure that we've hit everything. Here in this drill table, there's gonna be something that you should notice. In this drill table, what are we missing? We're missing hole tolerances. Now, 
if you're gonna be producing this board everywhere, meaning like you're gonna take it to multiple manufacturers, it's a good idea to list a hole tolerance. If this is just gonna be a prototype board, you don't generally need to list a hole tolerance, but for professional PCBs, we do like to list a hole tolerance. So that's something where you need to go back in here and say, select all of the vias. So I've got the via selection filter turned on, hit control A, and I can go down here into the properties panel, and you see here we have a section on tolerance. I can just put plus three, minus three, and we're good there. Then I can select these other four mounting holes that I have, and same thing, we'll do plus three, minus three. So that's usually a safe value to put as your tolerance. Fabricators are usually gonna be able to, to beat that number. We do another import of the board information into the drawing, and there we go, we've got everything. The last thing we would need to do is just fill in this uh, company name information and the project title. So here I'll go ahead and put Altium. And then here under the project title, switching regulator demo. And it's usually good to put like a part number. So PN, we'll just call it SW001 Rev A. This is gonna be the part number that we're gonna have on the board. And we actually do wanna put a part number somewhere in the design. So we're gonna put it in a silk screen layer, either on the top or the bottom. The top is a little crowded, so I would recommend putting it on the bottom. So here I'm in the bottom overlay layer. I'm just gonna select a string and put it in here. And I already copied it from my other drawing. I can just hit Control V. And you see it's pretty big. What you'll actually wanna do is set that to smaller text height and stroke width. And then um, you'll notice here that it needs to be mirrored also because it is on the bottom overlay. We can just set it here. And then once you have this set, once again, just check it in 3D, flip it over. And again, you'll see here, you have to be careful where you place this because I've put it right there overlapping onto this hole. This is another instance where it's actually a good idea to get out of single layer mode. I often work in single layer mode just because sometimes there's a lot of layers going on and it's uh, difficult to see everything when it gets really crowded. But this is another instance when you wanna get out of single layer mode just to make sure that you aren't uh, putting this silk screen somewhere where it's going to create a problem on that bottom layer. So now I think we've got everything. We can do one more import back into the assembly drawing. We wanna set the scale here. Let's go ahead and set this to, uh, let's say eight to one. We can set this one to eight to one. We'll fill in some of our drawing details and that'll be it. So I'm gonna wrap this up now and call it a day. The last thing we'll need to do is just create an out job file, which I have here. We can generate all of our outputs and then we've got a full package. We have everything that we need to send this into a fabrication house and get quoted. We can send it into an assembler so they can quote it and we're ready to go. All right, everybody, so that's everything. Uh, we've gone through and done all the cleanup that I think we should do on this. In the next video, we're actually gonna look at some of those outputs and get everything ready to send this in for manufacturing. So we're actually gonna put this into production with Ultimate. So it's gonna be a cool video and a cool intro to this new platform. So make sure you hit the subscribe button to see all of those notifications for new videos. Leave your questions and comments in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator because that's what we're gonna be doing in the next video. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah.